Okay, hi everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Trevor Roan, who is an assistant professor of physics at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York. Professor Roan received a liberal arts education from McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. He then went on to pursue his doctoral studies at Columbia University in New York, where he performed experimental work on two-dimensional electron systems in the extreme quantum limit. Afterwards, he spent several years at NTT Basic Research Laboratories in Japan, and during a research stint at the National Institute of Material Science in Japan, he transitioned to materials informatics research, exploiting machine learning tools to perform materials research. He continued this work as a postdoc at Harvard University, where he used machine learning tools to search for new 2D magnetic materials. So presently, Professor Rohn's research interests include using machine learning tools for materials discovery with a focus on the search for new 2D materials with exotic properties and predicting the outcome of industrially relevant catalytic reactions. In general, his group uses data analytics tools to aid in developing a better understanding of physical systems. Okay, thanks a lot for agreeing to give a colloquium today and feel free to get started. Well, thank you for mu so much for the kind invitation. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, feel free to ask uh, as many questions as you like, and um, you know, and don't feel feel shy about participating. I'm hoping to have this kind of uh, an interactive, a little bit interactive um, uh, discussion. Okay. So the title of my talk is "Data Driven Studies of Magnetic Two Dimensional Materials," and a lot of this work was done when when I was a postdoc in the group of Tim Taxiros at uh, at Harvard. Okay, so the, this work is a uh, very interdisciplinary. It's combining uh, theory with experiments in the form of digital data, along with statistical tools and computational methods to perform uh, material discovery. And hopefully a little bit of knowledge discovery as well. They'll, they'll all focus mostly on material discovery for most, uh, for most of the talk. An outline of the, the talk is so first I'll try to give you a motivation of why we wanna do this in the first place. And that's going to involve the challenges for materials discovery. And then I'll, I'll present a solution, which is going to be, oh, we'll do material informatics. I'll explain what I think material informatics is. And then we'll focus on a, a, a case study, the case of um, looking for two-dimensional magnetic materials. Okay. So I, I like beginning this, uh, this talk with this slide. This is a title of the paper by P.W. Anderson. And this is a picture of an electron over here on the, on the right side, and it, it has a spin. And the, uh, the idea behind this is that a collection of particles is more than just the sum of its individual components. And that there's some collective behavior that, that arises that controls the uh, kind of, uh, um, how do I say, the property of the system, which is more than just the property of its, of its components. So, so for instance, you can ask yourself what kind of collective behavior is emerging in the system that causes these, these spins to all align, okay? So th at the heart of this discussion, we will be using uh, non-traditional tools to try to tease out this idea. Can we represent some properties of a, of a, of a system, collective properties of a system using inputs that is, are describing their properties of an individual component, okay? And so these, these, are, these are electrons. And electrons in this study will exist in two-dimensional magnetic materials. And the idea is that we'll, we'll use machine learning to understand and study the, the magnetic properties, the spin properties of these 2D materials. Okay. Um, so the motivation behind this kind of started 2015, 2016 or so. And I was working in the lab of Amir Yukobi at Harvard doing experiments. I was doing ferromagnetic resonance experiments on these chromium germanium telluride materials. These are shown here. And this, this plot is a uh, chromium germanium telluride, one layer. Over here on the left are Moke measurements. Basically, these are core rotation spectroscopy measurements showing that down to two layers of CGT is ferromagnetic below the Curie temperature. And over here on the right is chromium triiodide, another layered ferromagnetic. And these are both layered ferromagnets. And this is again showing, this, this video graph is again showing the uh, mode measurements, but now for the hysteresis uh, field sweep, showing that down to one layer, you have a, a ferric magnet. 
So before this paper, these papers came out, I was doing work on this material doing Fermi inversions measurements. And I was trying to measure for the first time a 2D Fermi okay? I, I didn't quite get there. And they, they, um, these guys, they were very clever and they got there first. Um, but I, I learned some important things along the way. The first was that this material is fairly air sensitive. And the second was that the material, its resonance was outside the range of the, the um, material's properties. So it was outside the range of the equipment that I had. So I wanted to have a 2D material or a material that was two-dimensional, magnetic, chemically stable with slightly different magnetic properties. And so I went uh, about searching for this kind of material and sort of segued into um, doing higher throughput DFT, then some functional theory calculations and became, started my life as a, as a theorist after, after this. And I kind of joked that uh, at, the, at the time of doing this work, I would meet Pablo um, in, in talks and I knew that he was working on this as well. And so I felt a little bit like I was in competition against uh, with Pablo Hira Hero. And you know, when, when he published his very nice paper first, I felt a little bit defeated. So then I, I threw away my um, life as experimentalist and I became a theorist. You know, I'm, I'm just joking, but it was a nice, um, nice way to get started. Okay, and so why do we want to study magnetism 2D anyway? And so I, I'll give you two reasons. One is linked to the Merman Wagner theorem, which is a theorem that says, essentially you can't have magnetic ordering in two dimensions. And the way you, could, you can have that in two dimensional materials is that there is some uh, symmetry breaking, which arises due to the magnetic, um, magnetic crystalline anisotropy. And I'll say only a little bit about that. That's, it's, it's important for these materials, um, but I won't talk about it too much in the, in the talk. And the other thing is that there are some applications in, in data storage. Um, magnetic um, read only access, random access memory. Uh, and uh, the point of this slide I saw from an IBM um, website is that the technological innovation is really driven by materials, advances in materials. So you look at, uh, you know, 1974, the um, IBM invents the magnetic tunnel junction. Okay, so they can start doing this MRAM kind of uh, work. And in 1995, Mudir at MIT made another advancement uh, in the first room temperature magnetic tunnel junction. And you kind of progress a few years, 2004, something happens with a highly resistive uh, magnetic tunnel junction. And then 2010, you can flip the spin or rotate the spin to get these things to be perpendicular to the plane. And so like 40 years, it takes you to make these advancements. Wouldn't it be nice to make the materials advancements to drive technological innovation much faster? And this is at the heart of what the machine learning approach would like to do. Let's see if it actually gets there. So uh, our goal is to find new 2D materials and that should also be magnetic. So how do we do that? I'm proposing this materials informatics approach. And this is ultimately a, a data-driven approach. And the idea behind that is, can we take materials we know and, and love, like a graphene, you know, MLS2, black phosphorus, uh, chromium germanium telluride, chromium triiodide, just by looking at, say, the crystal structure, tell something about their magnetic properties. Can we look at graphene and see, ah, it's a hexagonal acid with the carbon atom we just know right away that it should be conductive, or they should be uh, semiconducting, or they should be chemically uh, unstable, or they should be ferromagnetic. So that's kind of the, the um, goal here. Okay, um, so materials informatics, we'll use it to do materials discovery and knowledge discovery. And we'll focus on 2D magnetic materials, looking at their chemical stability and their magnetic order. And we're hoping to extract some physical insight from studying these materials with this approach as well. Um, though this is a tougher thing and uh, you know people are still kind of working on how to do this. And just to highlight that this is a, a, the goal of this talk is to discover ferromagnetic materials as opposed to anti-ferromagnetic materials, but you can kind of do both. Um, both are potentially very interesting. Okay, um, so I will use Rudyard Kipling's poem to motivate the, the setup or the framework for this talk. And if you remember, it's, uh, I had six jolly, six jolly serving men. They taught me all I knew. The names were what and why and when and how and where and who. So let's begin with what is materials informatics? You can tell I really like this poem. And, uh, oh, I wanted to ask you a question first. So what do you think is materials informatics? I forgot this part. Feel free to chime in.
you've seen the picture, so you kind of know the answer already, but feel free to, to jump in and say something. Is there anything in the chat? Yes, in the chat, Scott Hunter says, using machine learning to discover new materials. That's right, that's actually, that's, that's the right answer. Okay, I was hoping for someone to give the wrong answer, but that's a good job. So the, 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 the funny answer is, is the following. It's uh, teaching, machine, teaching machines to, to, um, to do material science. And uh, here you have like the, the Linux machine answering the question, because we all know Linux machines are the best. And in the back, there's a Windows XP machine kind of falling asleep. Um, okay, this, this is a joke. Um, but all jokes aside, uh, you're right. It's uh, combining machine learning with material science. And the aim here is to use machine learning to approximate some function f of x, which takes as its input some parameters that are easily uh, attainable, like properties in the chemical table, um, chemical properties that are listed in a periodic table, and predict something that's difficult to measure or difficult to calculate, like the magnetic moment. Uh, interesting point is that it takes uh, this takes uh, n um, parameters. And n can grow quite large, so it takes potentially large space. Uh, the space of parameters is potentially large, and so essentially. Machine learning is taking advantage of the ability to process large parameter space. Uh, humans are good at uh, attracting patterns in low dimensional space. So two dimensions is pretty easy. Three, 3D is actually pretty easy. 4D is more challenging. If you count time, maybe it's not so bad. Um, but more beyond four dimensions, it's hard to look at patterns in the data. But the key advantage of machine learning is that machines don't really care about this. They, they can find patterns in data in a high, an arbitrarily high dimensional space. So there are some limitations. Okay. And this is a non-traditional approach to looking at uh, magnetism in 2D materials. Okay, so um, we talked about what is materials informatics and now let's, let's look at why we want to use materials informatics. Why use machine learning to study materials? Okay, so the first reason um, links to these, these databases and, the, and their size. So there's an ICST the inorganic uh, crystal structure database. This has uh, over 200,000 uh, inorganic compounds. The chemical abstract service has over 49 million organic and inorganic uh, compounds. And so if you wanted to find, say, uh, the perfect material just for you, and you didn't know where to look, taking this each material and say, looking at its um, uh, properties, either by first principles calculations or, or experiments is gonna be slow and, and expensive. Um, so. And this doesn't even touch the number of possible materials that could exist in the universe. Some estimates have the uh, number of possible molecules and inorganic crystal structures as 10 to the 100. So really a huge, a huge number. Okay. So now that we've looked at what we, materials informatics is and why it might be useful for us, let's uh, look at the when and the where and the who of materials informatics. Now here's the interactive part. I wanted you to take a minute um, close your eyes and imagine that you're a Greek alchemist living in, in ancient Greece. Okay, and then open your eyes and okay, you're, you're Plato and you're uh, living in ancient Greece and you have a small set of chemical elements. Okay, and these are they. And um, you know a few things about the chemical elements. You know that they have a certain color and you know the atomic number. So if, for instance, everyone knows that iron is yellow and the carbon is, uh, is blue. Okay. And you also know that there are elements that are called air, fire, water, and earth. And because you're, you're a clever um, Greek alchemist, you, you um, want to learn more about the nature and the world around us. And you choose uh, kind of an algorithm and um, a particular descriptor to do that. And you ask yourself, now, what is a good descriptor? Is it gonna be the color of the element or the atomic number? How can I? parse through this data to extract patterns. How can I learn the trend in these data? And to do that, you, you pick the atomic number and not the color because you're, you're a clever Greek alchemist. And you apply a model, an algorithm, and that sort these chemical elements in increasing atomic number. And if you do that, you get the following. You find you have hydrogen starting in the beginning, then helium, lithium, air, fire, water, earth, beryllium, and so on. And the key, trend here is a pattern that emerges. And what, what is the pattern that emerges here? 
Anyone, does anyone know? Anyone dabbled in alchemy before? Any brave souls in the chat wanting to comment? Okay, so I'll give you a hint. It's increasing by atomic number one, okay? Um, so th with this pattern in mind, this is the trend that emerges in the in data analysis. You might learn that air, fire, water, earth aren't really chemical elements and you, and you throw them out as some sort of uh, errors. And then there's also a number between six and eight, which happens to be seven. And does anyone know what uh, should lie between uh, carbon and oxygen on the periodic table? In our chat, Scott Hunter again says nitrogen. Nitrogen, yes, Scott Hunter is on fire. It's good, good job. That's that's correct. And so uh, Scott will continue playing this game of looking for gaps in, in his data and eventually filling them and eventually finding that he has developed a periodic table of elements. And in this case, um, we have a chemical descriptor space of two. It's a column number and the row number. And with this, we can look at all patterns in the periodic table and extract something about the meaning of what the chemical properties should be for a given row number and um, and uh, column number. Okay, so this is kind of a fun example everyone's familiar with. But really, the question is, can we do something similar for crystal structures? Can we look at graphene and its hexagonal lattice of carbon atoms, compare that with a hexagonal lattice of boron and nitrogen, and learn without doing complicated calculations and measurements? something about the, the electrical conductivity, for instance, okay? So, so we'll apply this, uh, this idea to uh, magnetism. And let's look at ferromagnetic condition metal alloys to start. So I'm plotting here on the horizontal axis, the available atomic volume, and on the vertical axis, the calculated chemical hardness which goes like d mu dn, where mu is the chemical potential. And I'm labeling each point that I, I think measure or calculate in this, in this uh, plot to get the magnetic order as uh, open, a closed square, which means it's ferromagnetic, or an open square, which means it's, it's um, sorry, the closed square means it's not magnetic, and the open square means that it's, it's ferromagnetic. If you zoom in on this region here, we get this part of the plot. And you notice that there's a clearly defined region that has these ferromagnetic alloys and everywhere else is um, not magnetic. Okay. So essentially this is a two-dimensional space, a two-dimensional chemical space. And by looking at some part of the space, you could know right away what the um, magnetic properties are. Um, you might uh, agree or disagree. But let, let me ask you, if you're to find a new compound, which you didn't know is magnetic order, but you know it falls in this part of the space. What would you uh, guess is uh, magnetic order for this particular compound? Is it magnetic or not? Michaela says not magnetic. Yes, Michaela is right. That's exactly correct. And um, what, Michaela, what about what about here? Is it magnetic or not? Magnetic. Yes, it's magnetic. So you're well on your way to becoming a machine learning expert. So this is essentially what we're doing in machine learning. We're looking at patterns in data and using that identification of a pattern to make these quantitative predictions. In this case, it's, it's a classification of this material being either a ferromagnetic or, or a non-magnetic material, okay? By the way, feel, feel free to ask questions as, um, as um, we go either shout it out or, or send it in the, the chat. Okay. Um, so let's change gears a bit and talk more about the machine learning framework. So in machine learning, typically you need some data. You need the materials descriptors and uh, statistical models. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the data. Uh, because there are um, many databases that exist that describe materials these days, this kind of materials informatics approach is becoming more and more um, popular. Also, there are chemical descriptors that exist that uh, describe materials really precisely and accurately, such as the Coulomb kernel or the bag of bonds representations. This is a, these are fairly old, but uh, descriptors that I like and are easy to kind of understand, but they're more fancy um, ones down the road. 
of doing a better job of describing, for instance, crystal structures. And then people are spending their career doing this, so it's, it's really good for someone who wants to apply those tools. And there's also nice statistical models that uh, are easily uh, accessible online, such as Python packages, scikit-learn, or Google's TensorFlow, which implements uh, neural network models. Okay. Um, so I mean, let's look at data. Everyone know that data exists in the cloud. And we have different uh, materials data bases that exist for this materials project, which should be familiar for, for some of you. Uh, there's Aflow, which is also a popular DFT database. These are both DFT, by the way. Density functional, density functional theory, which are kind of like materials simulations, okay, quantum simulations. Uh, there's Matnavi, which is a database based at the National Institute of Material Science in, in Japan, uh, which uh, has uh, comprises experimental data. And there's a C2DB, which is focusing on just two-dimensional materials and uh, are calculated by DFT. There's also the OQMD, uh, the NOMAD, which is kind of a repository for DFT data, and I think perhaps other forms of first principle calculations as well. And there's an inorganic crystal structure database, which just has experimental X-ray diffraction data and the crystal structures of the materials. Okay, so there are quite quite a few databases now, and there there are many more that exist that I I haven't talked about or, or haven't heard about. Okay, um, there's also descriptors which are really available, which makes the machine learning process relatively straightforward, at least to get started. And so uh, these these descriptors are are could be comprising atomic properties or other mathematical representations of a crystal structure. Uh, so, so in the case of um, the example we talked about before on the PR table, let's say we have an ionic compound and we, we apply our domain knowledge and we realize that um, the ionic compounds are typically coming from different elements, sorry, different columns in the PR table. So a good guess for a descriptor would be the column number to try to build a model. It's one way of approaching it, okay? There are other, and there are also statistical models, which we can which we can use that people have already built and uh, place in packages that we can just download and use in free software like, like Python. And one model that you're familiar with probably is this model, the, the linear model, right? And the, the one that's maybe less familiar is one based on decision trees. And this example is for whether you give a credit card or not. It's kind of a silly example, but it's kind of a fun way to learn about how these entries works. So let's take these three descriptors. There's the age, there's the student status, and there's a credit card rating. You can diverse the tree by asking, you know, what is what is the person's age? If they're young, you ask, uh, are, are they a student? If, if they're not a student, then you do not give them the credit card. Sorry, if they're not a student, you don't give them the credit card. If they are a student, then you then you do give them the credit card. And this is for classification. And you can repurpose this for, for doing regression as, as well. And the great thing about this, all these things, that you, you have tools that exist in this really nice ecosystem that builds uh, puts everything together in one, one place that you can you can play with um, at, at home on, on your laptop. So there's ways to store your data on MongoDB. You can transform your data with, with Python. You can build models with scikit-learn, and you can visualize your nice results using that topic. So let's just change gears a bit and then talk about kind of a potential material system of interest. And um, the one that I focused on in the beginning was this class of magnetic 2D materials that is based on these transition metal tricalcogenides. I think chromium germanium telluride is perhaps the most famous. It, it turns out this is a, a, a monolayer ferromagnet. It's predicted to be a monolayer ferromagnet, where the, the chromium atoms sit on the A sites. The germanium atoms sit on the B sites, here and here. And the tellurium atoms sit on the X sites, so three above the plane and three below. This is the same picture for chromium germanium telluride. And you can see from the top, kind of the top down, and the uh, chromium atoms form this hexagonal uh, lattice of A sites. The B sites are at the center of the hexagon, and there are three X sites above and below the plane. Okay. This is the ABX 
um, structure, crystal structure. Now it turns out that if you swap germanium, uh, non magnetic atom with silicon, another non magnetic atom, then you can really change the magnetic order for this structure. When I first saw this paper, I was intrigued by that, and that helped me to get interested in pursuing this, this research. And um, that's what I did. I, I would decorate these these uh, A, B, and X sites in different ways and look at their um, magnetic properties. I would focus on the ferromagnetic order and also the neo anti ferromagnetic order, the ferromagnetic order. Turns out that uh, chromium silicon telluride actually has a zigzag anti ferromagnetic order, where along the zigzag edge, the spins are pointing in one direction, and along the other edge, they're, they're reversed. In the neo type AFM um, configuration, every other spin is spin reversed. So, for, for the sake of the computational expense, I focused on these two magnetic configurations. And I, I used VFT to replace the A, B, and X lines and to generate a, a data set of 198 compounds. Okay. And it turns out if you, if you decorate this A, B, X structure with uh, you know, all the transition metals, uh, all the calcogens, and different B sites comprising silicon, germanium, phosphorus, and so on, then you get about 10 to 4 combinations. Quite a few possible, quite a few candidates for these ABX six structures. And I focused on just looking at 200 of them in the beginning, you know, 198 in the beginning. And from the DFT calculations, I extracted the formation energy, the magnetic order, and also the magnetic moment. In particular, I replaced one of two chromium sites with another transition metal, and that's listed here. And I replace the B site with combination of silicon, germanium, and phosphorus. For instance, the silicon 2 or silicon germanium or germanium phosphorus as the B sites. And the X sites were always, always, uh, were always either all tellurium, all selenium, or all sulfur. And this is kind of a control representation of the atomic substitution. So we have A sites here, B site substitutions here, B site substitutions here. Next slides. Uh, yeah. So we can then uh, do the calculations and collect the data and compare the this quantity I'm calling delta E, which is the difference between the, the DFT energy for the ferromagnetic configuration and that of the anti ferromagnetic configuration. And so if this value is negative, that means the ferromagnetic structure is lowering energy. And therefore, the DFT theory predicts that this material should be ferromagnetically ordered. If the reverse is true, the AFM has lower energy, then it predicts that the AFM should have the, the, uh, the structure should have the AFM order in, in, in nature. Okay. So I, I can calculate this value of delta E and display the result. This is for the tellurium, x equals tellurium. On the left panel, center panel is for selenium. And on the right is just for sulfur. And the horizontal axis are the B-side substitutions the vertical axis is the A side substitutions, and the color represents the um, this value for delta E. So chromium germanium telluride sits on this square right here. Each square represents a different crystal structure. Chromium, see, I can't see my cursor. It's, it's right here. Chromium germanium telluride. That's blue, and blue is over here. It's a negative number. So you know right away that this is a fair magnet, uh, as um, as we find in experiments, at least. As far as I know, no one has measured one layer of CGT yet, but for, for bilayer, you have it, have it, uh, have it being for a okay. And if, if it's a red a square, for instance, if you're here, it means that this structure, uh, that structure is chromium, vanadium, phosphorus, germanium, selenide, that is predicted to be an anti ferro okay. Notice that there, um, oh, and there, these purple uh, squares, which represent structures that are anti ferromagnetic but this delta E can't be constrained. And the, the black squares represent structures that are ferromagnetic but again, this delta E can't be constrained. And I, and I can explain why that is if, if you'd like to, to know the details. But the main point of this graph is that there are some patterns in the data. There's these uh, swathes of purple colored um, areas that are kind of surrounding mostly blue, containing mostly blue squares. and the goal is to extract these patterns using um, statistical models for quantitative predictions. 
Another thing we could do with these LTE, I'll do and try to make quantity predictions, is to estimate Curie temperature. And one thing I'm leaving out of this estimate is a magnetic anisotropy, which actually is quite important for predicting Curie temperature. But this is still roughly an estimate for, Curie, for the Curie temperature. And so you take the Hamiltonian, this Heisenberg model, Heisenberg Hamiltonian, and you extract the DFT energy for the ferminic states and the new anti ferminic states. And using these, uh, these formulas, you can have an estimate for the Curie temperature. Okay. And if we do that, we can compare the Curie temperature of our predictions with that of chromium beam and telluride. It turns out that 49 Kelvin or so, our prediction is close to what people actually measure in, in experiments. Okay. The key point here is that by making atomic substitutions, you can increase the Curie temperature um, up to 134 Kelvin for chromium. Uh, phosphorus uh, telling on. Another thing we're interested in is the magnetic moment. So we, we can make a plot of magnetic moment versus crystal structure. And again, we have curium, selenium, and sulfur containing um, ABX structures with, again, the A side substitution, the vertical axis, and the B side substitutions on the horizontal axis. And we find that there is, a, and the color now is magnetic moment. And there's this pattern that arises in the magnetic moment that we are hoping to extract from a DFT from a machine learning model and uh, use that model to make quantitative predictions. Okay. Now, notice here that chromium vanadium telluride is sitting here. And that just by making a substitution with manganese uh, here, you can get a high magnetic moment. You can also replace it with iron and get a lower magnetic moment, which is a little bit surprising. You just look at the atomic um, number of unfatal electrons for iron. And the idea is to, again, learn these patterns in the data to see how precisely the magnetic moment can change with the, the crystal structure. Okay. So another thing we can do before we get to the machine learning is just look at the data in some interesting way. So. Um, we know that the, we, we're thinking that the crystal structure is somehow linked to many properties. So let's make a plot of crystal structure and many properties. And how do we do that? We take the crystal structure, and we plot, for instance, this distance between the A site and the X site, this distance here. And we plot that against many moment. So this is the A1, X1 distance. This is mu for the many moment. And we see that there's some variation in the, in the data. And at some you know, value for this A1, X1 distance, U tends to be large. Okay. You can also plot this distance between X1 and X2, this distance here. And for some you know, special value, well, the trend is as you make X1, X2 larger in this data set, the U tends to grow, grow bigger. So something there's some link between the structure and the many properties. You can also make a you know, fancier plot and do principal component analysis. Does everyone know what principal component analysis is? Well, if you don't, this is your lucky day because I'll, I'll explain it on the next slide. And so we're plotting the first principal component versus the mu. And we again see that there's, by the way, these, these components are comprising these AA1, uh, X2, these interatomic distances. Okay, we use the interatomic distances to build, uh, to do our principal component analysis. And if you plot PC1 versus PC2, you see that for some reason or other, in the component space, the magnetic moment tends to be big. So this gives you an idea that there's something between the crystal structure and, and the uh, magnetic moment. Okay. So I promised to explain principal component analysis. The idea is that you have some variation in data. This is some arbitrary data set for X1 and X2. And the idea is to make a transformation of coordinates such that the coordinate with the most variation, the first principal component, the um, second most, the second, and so on. And this is, comes in handy in, in a high dimensional space. For instance, there's not much variation uh, in uh, the third principal component, this, this here, this is PC1, PC2, and it's pretty flat. It's kind of a pancake. So you can throw away this, um, this component if you like, and it makes your data analysis kind of more, more manageable. And also, you can extract trends like the ones shown here. Okay. Um, 
So we're not only caring about magnetic properties, we also want to make this thing in a lab eventually. So we also care about chemical stability. And we attempt to estimate chemical stability by plotting information energy. And that's, that's shown here. And for the same scheme, uh, A site substitution for the vertical axis, B site substitution for the horizontal axis, uh, for different next values, tulium, selenium, sulfur. Now the color is information energy. Where the darker color means is the crystal structure tends to be more, chem more chemically stable. And there's a, there's a clear pattern now in data going from the left to the right, of transition metals becomes less stable as the D orbitals, for instance, in copper that get filled. And going from the second row from left to right of the transition metals, the trend is, is again holding. As you go up the column six from tellurium to sulfur, this is getting darker, which means that the chemical stability is getting stronger. Information energy is getting more. Okay. So we want to build machine learning models in the end. And so we need to have some way of of creating inputs for our models. And for that, we use these materials and scriptures. And what I did was pretty simple-minded. I just used atomic properties to build a, a kind of a fingerprint or chemical descriptor to describe each compound. And the way I did that was taking some atomic properties like P, P be atomic number, and calculating the mean for all my A, B, and X signs. So one property could be, or one descriptor could be the mean of the atomic number of A, B, and X. And then I also calculate the variance and so on. By taking different chemical properties and playing this game, I got a total of 61 descriptors for my system. And atomic properties I used were things like the number of unpaired electrons, the atomic radius, and, and so on. Okay. So and then I can build a model. So this one is based on decision trees, which you're familiar with now. And uh, it's actually based on all, all actually called something called random forest regression. As I said, as I said, is based on decision trees, and it takes inputs, uh, um, your set of chemical descriptors, and it tries to predict, for instance, the magnetic moment. And you train the data, um, train the model on some fraction of your data, and then you can kind of look at how it performed by looking at the test data, comparing the prediction to the test data. And here is some some math that shows how the fitting is done. Um, but I like this picture that's coming next a bit better. And just to keep in mind that this tree, um, if you look at this region, it has depth one. If you look at this region, it's a little bit deeper in depth two. And this has three nodes, one, two, three, lower, so it's depth three. That's, that's important here, where we're looking at an example of how we can do regression with these decision trees. Okay. And now the data we're showing here is just a sine curve with some noise. And the goal is to learn the underlying function, learning the sine curve by doing this kind of fitting analysis. So in the first um, tree that has depth one, it predicts that this side here is about 0.5, and this region here is about minus one. As we make the tree more complicated, it fits the data a little bit better. At depth three, it's doing a pretty good job of fitting the data. Um, but if we make the tree too complicated, then the model starts to fit to the noise and this is, this is bad. We want to avoid this. So we play tricks to avoid fitting to the noise in the data. Okay. All right. Another example of the machine learning process, which I'll use, I'll, I'll use a different model to illustrate that. I'll use the linear model. Um, we'll do a linear regression. So here we have some data, and these these um, blue circles are the training data, and um, looks like a line. So let's fit a line to it. The machine learning is about learning M, the slope, and learning C, the intersect. So once you fit line, you've done some machine learning. Then once you, you have a model that can predict all these uh, Y values given your, your X input, compare it to the, the data, the test data. The test data are the, the data the model hasn't seen. And in this case, these red scores are pretty close to the, the line. That means that the model is doing pretty good job. And so what we can do is we can build a model using our data and our descriptors and try to uh, see if it makes sense for predicting um, DFT results. And so here I'm plotting the DFT and link moment versus the machine learning prediction. And the dashed line here is not a fit, it's just a guide to the eye. That's a perfect prediction line. So that means if the points fall on that line, machine learning, machine, machine learning model made a perfect prediction. And you see both for the training data the test data, 
small is doing a pretty good job. Okay, the error is really low, and the R squared value is, is high. The nice thing about the random forest uh, model is that you can attempt to extract scripture importances. And you can rank them in terms of importance. So for instance, this model tells us that in order to make a really good prediction, that's the one on the left, it uses the mean number of unpaired electrons as the most important descriptor. So if you know something about magnetism, you know that this isn't surprising, but it's a good sending check in this case. You can imagine a situation where the scripture becomes important, but it was surprising result. And then in this case, you're potentially learning something new. It gives you a kind of a, a direction to learn something about physics you perhaps didn't know before. Okay. Right. So we also care about chemical stability, as I said. So we build a model to predict, to predict the formation energy. Uh, in this case, I use three different models because they all work pretty well. I use kernel width regression, which I didn't tell you about, but it's a lot like linear regression with constraints. The random forest model we talked about, and I also use a simple neural network model to predict the formation energy. And we can compare the DFT results, the means you're learning predictions, and they all, they're all doing fairly well. So um, I was very happy with this. So in the end, uh, I wanted to then make some predictions. And uh, I didn't, I should point out again, in the beginning, I started with a data set about, of about 200 structures, but I had about 10,000, actually about 30,000 to choose, sorry, yeah, 30,000 to choose from. Yeah, let me go to 10 to the floor. And I didn't want to spend, well, I, I spent six months doing these calculations for 200 structures. I didn't want to spend several years in my postdoc calculating structures. So I just um, thought, well, you know, I can train a model of 200, then predict the remaining 10 to the four with my, with my model, and then check to see if it actually makes sense. So that's what I did. I, I predicted in milliseconds on my laptop, 4,400 different structures. I'm showing you only, only some of those structures here for the magnetic moment, and then for the formation energy. And from these, I picked the best ones to check it with DFT. And in, in the end, there's this process where you can start with a large pool of structures, and then pick ones that have a good stability using a combination of DFT and emission learning predictions. And then in the end, pick those that have, for instance, high stability and a large magnetic moment to say. And uh, I chose the screening criteria, kind of arbitrarily be something that's above five Bohr magnetons, close to the magnetic moment for CGT, and um, less than the formation energy for CGT, which means it should be more chemically stable than, than CGT. Which I, which I complained wasn't chemically stable enough for, for my, my liking. And then once you do this, you get some results for DFT predictions and machine learning results. And uh, some of these I didn't find in the literature. So they could be potentially new candidates for, for new TD ferromagnetic materials. Now, let's say you don't trust the DFT and you definitely don't trust machine learning. And you want some like, evidence that it's um it's it's not just like hocus pocus and hand waving. Uh, then I, I went and I also wanted to do the same thing, and so I, I used the results that I found, and I did a really careful literature search. I would look for, for instance, this compound in the literature and this one in the literature, and a bunch of others that I, I would predict it. And I found that there was a class of these uh, metal thiophosphates or metal selenophosphates that um. I didn't know about it before, but you know, people have been working on that for quite a while, quite a while. Turns out that they had about a thousand papers going back hundreds of years uh, with these um, uh, research. And the MPT family contains about 200 known, known compounds. These are all measured in the bulk. They have the same structure than the ones I was trying to find. Differences, uh, the phosphorus here is replaced. The, in my study, I, I was open to looking at germanium and silicon as well but this is fixed to be phosphorus. The structure is pretty much um, the same, okay? If you look at a periodic table, uh, you find that the um, A site substitutions are kind of all over the place and for the sulfides and the, um, for the selenides, the A site substitutions are also quite spread. And I focused only on, on these, this set. So they're perhaps more materials than I anticipated. Interestingly, these materials are interesting for uh, quite a few things, including hydrogen storage and um, catalysis, which I didn't know um, before reading this paper. And you might've noticed that I'm focusing on these phosphorocotating compounds for this literature review, 
turns out most of the structures that I found in my, my um, machine learning predictions and DFT predictions, the phosphorus containing ones didn't satisfy the requirements. But there was one that did that um, I couldn't find in the review paper. But I did find a literature um, review from um, someone's PhD thesis that said that they had measured, uh, they synthesized chromium germanium selenide, selenide, and in the bulk, they measured its magnetic properties, but they haven't thinned it down yet. So it's hard to say what the um, monolayer properties are and uh, verify the prediction. But at least the chemical stability seems to be pretty, pretty hopeful. Okay. So to summarize, I identified new chemically stable 2D fragments with this machine learning approach. I could tune their magnetic properties and their chemical stability by making atomic substitutions. Uh, I showed that machine learning provides fast and accurate estimates for the properties of 2D magnetic materials. For instance, I, I predicted the properties of these ABX six compounds, uh, over 4,000 of them in a few milliseconds on a, on a laptop. And it took me uh, six months to do 200 compounds using DFT. And I would extract their magnetic properties and their, their um, information energy. And that this is a, a non-traditional tool, quickly becoming like a widespread tool for looking at magnetism in 2D materials. And if you'd like some more details, uh, please visit my, my um, paper. And this is a QR code for the paper. And this is the, um, the reference here. It recently came out, so I'm very happy to, to be able to advertise this. And to uh, uh, acknowledge the XC for the compute time and also Odyssey for their uh, compute time. And thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. Um, you can hear silent clapping. Okay, <laughs> are, there, <laughs> are there the sound of one hand clapping? <laughs> are there any questions? Please go ahead and type questions in our question and answer window, or go ahead and raise your hand, and we can unmute you and allow you to ask questions. I guess I will ask a question. Um, are you able to distinguish which, which materials would be van der Waals materials? This is all restricted to 2D from the beginning or? Um, yeah, in the beginning, I, I would focus on just uh, a monolayer. Well, I would calculate a monolayer, but it's a really great question. And I actually checked that. I don't have the results here, um, but I would look at the cleavage energy. And for all the structures that I found interesting, um, more than the ones here, the cleavage energy kind of matched the, that of chromium germanium telluride, which suggests that you can you can cleave it down to a few layers. Yeah. Okay. Other questions. So the talk about they're really clear or very opaque. I'm not sure which one. <laughs> Oh, wait a bit. Sometimes when I start to close out questions, here we go. Ruben asked, but Ruben, you're also feel, oh, okay, multiple questions are popping up in the chat window. Um, Ruben asks, in many material defects, in many materials, defect structure plays an important role. Is it possible to include defect structure into the machine learning approach? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I, that's really an active area of research. As far as I know, no one has done this, but I know people are working on it, including including me. I also want to work on this. Now, I think there is a uh, there is a, a, a way to include defects in, in this kind of modeling. Just a, uh, another way of describing the materials properties, I'm sorry, materials crystal structure. And one would need a, um, a better descriptors that I, I, I have here, which are just kind of changing the chemical elements. Um, but I, I'm fairly hopeful and I think it's it's doable. At least, you know, it's, it's interesting enough to give it a try. Okay, so thanks. Then graduate student Lucas Eddy asks, does interlacing interlayer spacing tell you anything about whether or not the materials are van der Waals? Yeah, I think you can, uh, in, in silico, vary the spacing and um, extract um, what people call the cleavage, cleavage energy. 
So how much the layers like to be like together. And if you find it's a certain value, then you can you can kind of peel the layers off of off of each other. And then that means that you, you can make a this kind of layer material. So then you can tell it's, it's van der Waals. So you can certainly figure it out with um, with this approach. The the actual absolute value the 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 spacing between layers. Uh, this is an interesting question. I, I don't know, but the, how I would find out is by making like a plot of different materials, looking at correlation between their interlayer spacing and see if I can tell if one, th one thing is, is, is layered or not. Hey, thank you. So then Matthew Jones asks, do you have any examples available for anyone interested to try? Do you have any examples available for anyone interested to try? So a uh, new material to try to, to maybe grow and I assume he means for growth. Yeah. So here, here code, code examples. Here we go. Ah. Yes, he's asking for code examples. There we go. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I haven't made my code publicly available. Um, it's something I, I keep hearing. If you, if you want to kind of, if this, the question is more about how to get started, there is a way to do that. I, I should have put it here. If you, if you go to the, the website I have, which I is not, is it somewhere here? No, it's not. It's um. No, it's basically www.materials-informatics.com. I have this is my group website. There's there's a page called. It's um called, I think, uh, references or, um, help section or something like this. You, you can find a list of, of useful websites and tools to get you started. And if if you want to, talk about the kind of the particular codes for what I did to um. Complete this project. I, I can tell. I can send you that as well. This kind of program. So is that basically? I think I found this website, materialsintelligence.com/resources. Yeah, that's right. It's resources. Yes. Thank okay, you. great. So I um, posted that into the chat window that all panelists and attendees should be able to see. Great. Thank you so much. Okay, then. Randy Lemon says, I want the speaker to know it was a clear talk to me and well done. It's not my area of research, so nice work. <laughs> Great, thank you for the feedback. I appreciate it. Okay, are there any other questions? Feel free to type them in the chat, the question and answer window, or raise your hand to ask a question yourself. Okay, so. Matthews Jones asks, what framework did you use to run the training routines? So I use a few things. And so I typically I would use, I would code in Python and um, I would build, uh, build my, you know, once I have my DFT data, I'd import it into my Python notebook using a program called Pandas. Is it this kind of level of, of framework or, you, or something else? So Matthew says PyTorch, TensorFlow, okay, Keras. Yeah. Yep. So for the models, I used um, Scikit-Learn. I I did use I did use uh, Keras to do this prediction here. Where is it? Uh, I think I can't find it in the talk. But for, to do the neural network prediction for my formation energy, I used uh, a Keras package. Keras is kind of the simplest thing you can do to do machine learning modeling for, sorry, neural network modeling. And for the implementing the, the um, kernel edge regression and the random forest regression, here we go. I used scikit-learn. Thanks, so then, oh, um, Matthew asks, have you looked at using XGBoost? I haven't looked at using XGBoost. I think I've heard of XGBoost, but I actually haven't tried it. it sounds like it's a class of um, decision trees, based on decision trees. Yeah, so these, these kinds of models are very powerful and similar to random forest, but uh, I haven't tried that one in particular. If you think it's somehow special for and maybe better than what I've done here, please please let me know. I can, I can give it a try. Matthew, I promoted you to panelists. <laughs> I, I guess I was Go for asking it. too many questions. No, that's great. This is, it's much better this way than having me ask all the questions. Yes. I'm sitting here like trying to type this. Like, you know, like, no, this is I... better. <laughs> Thank you for asking. So continue on and ask. Uh, yeah. 
okay. continue where I left off. <laughs> sure, I'll share my screen there, or my, my face. Uh, hi. Hi, um, how are you? <clears throat> thanks for your talk, Trevor. I, it was That's really great. I enjoyed it quite a lot. Um, so I, I guess I'm wondering, are you using, um, like what, when you say that you're running scikit-learn and you're using random forests to uh, generate uh, machine learn uh, models for inference, mm -hmm. um, are you using CPU-based routines? CPU-based routines? CPU-based, like, or- Oh yeah, using... this, this is on my, my laptop. Yeah, gotcha. so these models are pretty simple and um, yeah, they, they can be trained fairly quickly. Even for this neural network model, the network is pretty small, so it can be trained pretty quickly, um, and it takes you know some minutes to get trained on a, on a laptop. Um, but you know, as you have more complicated descriptors and more data to that you want to train, using a GPU is really kind of what you want to, where you want to go. I do have a product where I need a GPU to do my training, um, but for for the ones in the paper, I, I just use my, my laptop to do all the modeling, which is pretty convenient. Right on. Of course, that makes for, sense. for the DFT, I, I needed a supercomputer to generate those data. Yeah. So, how much um, how much training data goes into some of these models? So, in the end, I told you that I used about two hundred to begin with. Turned out at two hundred, I can get pretty good um, formation energy predictions, but the um, magnetic moment predictions were pretty pretty crappy. And so, for this, I had to increase my my data set, and I increased it to about three hundred. And at around like 200 or so, if you plotted the model performance versus data set size, you find that about 200 or so, the performance has to start to plateau for this data set and for these descriptors. Um, and so then you can, you can kind of stop at around 200 for, for this data set. When you say 200, you mean 200 samples? 200 samples, yeah. Gotcha, okay. Cool. Do you have um, maybe contact information that I could maybe uh, follow yeah, up some can, of my other questions can, with? See, my email is roant at rpi.edu. And I don't think, yeah, here it is. It's roant at rpi at the bottom of the page. Edu. Great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. And then we have one question from Nicholas. Could you do or have you done a secondary or meta learning on the choice of descriptors? that best describe your system? I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, secondary or meta learning? I'm, on the... What I'm understanding is that they are asking if you can do another machine learning algorithm to um, appropriately choose the descriptors. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, yeah, that's a good question. And I, I, there's, one could probably do a better job of doing this than I have done. And there are people who actually focus on on just that. And there's a my Brain Life paper by, I think the author's name is Luca Ghirangeli. And it's titled The Critical Role of the Descriptor. And they have a nice discussion on kind of these, these kind of descriptors I'm using, where you kind of stitch together atomic properties into some sort of descriptor. It's a very nice paper, so please, please take a look. Um, but what I've done in, in this work, uh, I can comment on that a little bit. So I have a set of descriptors. I, I chose 61 in the beginning. And actually, when I tried all 61 in the beginning, I got a pretty bad result. It's not so surprising because you have 61 descriptors and 200 points to begin with. And so you know the model isn't going to work very well. There are too many, too many um, fitting parameters in, in the model. So I reduced it a bit. And I would throw away descriptors that weren't important. And um, I could do this by doing this kind of uh, model importance fit, where models that didn't have any importance, I threw them away. And I reevaluated the, the model. And in the end, I found that this is the most important. This is the second most important, and so on. And um, you can kind of then think, oh, you know, this why is this descriptor the most important? And then you think, well, it's mean number of unpaid electrons, and that kind of makes sense if you understand how magnetism works. And this descriptor is um, a little complicated to explain in a few minutes without slides. It's just some way of parameterizing essentially the um, uh, you could say that the crystal structure of the material. And there are other descriptors like number of valence electrons, equipoisability. And you can kind of tell that the number of valence electrons should be important in, in predicting the many properties. So I, I think that sort of, sort of answers your question. 
Yeah, that does. Thank you. Um, I don't have as much experience in um, machine learning, so that that makes it clear how you would do a, a descriptor um, okay. screening Great. or not screening, but reduction, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I, I have a follow up question now. Mm -hmm. um, so when you say descriptor importance, are you evaluating this based on the output of something like a grid search? So I would essentially so, so, so I, I would do a grid search to find the hyperparameters for the for the model, and I, I think in this case, I, I would then repeat the whole process and return the average uh, importance with keeping one descriptor out of it. So, so the, way, the way it works is you have say ten descriptors, and you evaluate the model performance with those ten descriptors, and you take one out and do it again. And you see how much this, this the difference kind of dropped, the difference in the performance. Uh, you see, see how much the performance dropped. You put it back in, you take another one out and repeat. And then you basically, the ones that have the biggest drop in the performance are the ones that are most important. And the ones that have the smallest drop in performance are the ones that are least important. But do it carefully, you're doing a grid search and then doing the hyperparameter fitting uh, each, each time. So it's kind of like a, a lengthening process. But for, for the, if, if the data set is small, then it actually, it's not so bad. It takes, you know, 10, 10 minutes, something like this, and it's not so bad. Okay. So it's like a, so every time you take one out, you're running another hyperparameter grid search to evaluate yeah. model perform, best model performance without that parameter. That's right. Yeah. Okay. That, um, that's correct. Okay, thanks. We have a question from Ruben. Ruben, I'll let you ask your question since you're a panelist. Yeah, I'm, I'm just wondering, are, are most of your models done at uh, zero temperature? Can you take into account finite temperature? Because like, for example, if you're looking for ferromagnetic material at higher temperature, it might be paramagnetic, lower. So can you talk about that a little? Yes, it's a good question. And so all the data are, are done at zero Kelvin. And um, the, the temperature is kind of playing a role when you try to estimate the Curie temperature. Um, but we haven't done I think typical to do with TOT, to my knowledge, how the uh, magnetic order changes with temperature. That's something that um, is not included in this in this study. Okay. Okay. Are there any last questions? If there are, I'll give you thirty seconds to type them into either the question and answer box or the chat window. Okay, I believe there are no more questions. So let's thank uh, Professor Rohn one more time for his excellent talk. Uh, thank you very much, especially being on the East Coast. Those of you who are on the East Coast, we force you to speak during and after dinner time. <laughs> so, and after, well, after your work day. So we really appreciate it. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Okay, so bye everyone. Yep, thanks again. Nice meeting you all. Thanks for the nice questions. Great. Okay, I, I think everyone stopped. Thanks again um, for inviting me.